Hello everyone, my name is Corazar, and welcome back to the Vintage Story Guide. We are back in the world on this rainy day, so I am waiting for a bunch of these molds to fire. As promised, I made a bunch of molds after last episode. Where are they? Here we go. We have a falx blade, two pickaxe molds, a hammer mold, and two ingot molds. And currently firing, we have a prospecting pick mold, an anvil mold, a shovel mold, and an axe mold. And those should be done probably later today, and we'll get the second set going. And today, I wanted to expand on our setup here, because we're going to run out of room inside here really fast. Because we're going to need to be putting down these molds, and we're going to have nowhere to walk, because, well, if we do, we'll hurt our feet, and we'll get burned and we'll die. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to expand our little base here. Not a ton. This isn't our permanent abode after all. But we do need to make sure we have enough room to work. And I was thinking we could use some of these church stones and we could turn them into some cobblestone slabs. And those would make a mighty fine wall for us. And we'll do that by bringing some of this blue clay into the mix. And you can use blue or fire clay, it doesn't really matter. But what I'm thinking is that I want to have a couple little outside areas. I want to have an area for doing some smithing and some casting. I want to have an outside area for a dedicated kiln. And a little outside area for dedicated charcoal production. We won't need a ton while we're living here. Oh, hey, look at that. We're all done. But yeah, we won't need a ton while we're living here. But we do want to make sure we have enough room to make at least a little bit here and there. So I'm thinking that an area that's maybe a little bit larger than our house in both dimensions would be perfect. So I think the first thing we want to do is we're going to tear down this up here. And this right here. And we'll pick up all of our new molds from the pit kilns. We'll tuck them inside here, just for the time being. And we'll go ahead and we'll fill this in for now. We might come back and dig that up later, but that's for later in the episode. Alright, let's go ahead and we're going to make us some of these here slabs. And I'm thinking we'll start with just a full stack and see how well that does us. I think what we're going to do is we're going to expand this probably by one block. There we go. And then we'll start bringing it out this way, like so. Something a bit like that ought to be enough. And we'll do the same on this side. There we go. I think that should be probably a large enough yard for doing what I want to do. Now that used just over half of our available cobblestone slabs. We're going to go ahead and we're going to double these up. And then I'll make another stack or so of the slabs. Okay, there we go. It's a fairly simple start. Now this isn't how it's going to end up looking, but I wanted to get the wall and the box in so that we can modify it as we go. I'm going to go ahead and get a bite to eat, probably sleep, make it day, and then we'll keep working because it is medium out here as far as rift activity goes, so I don't want to be cut out with all the growlies hanging around at night. So I will see all of you in the morning when we are ready to keep working on our little build out here. Alright folks, we are back in the morning, and I was thinking we should probably put together some fences or some fence gates so that we can get out of our little backyard here. And I'm thinking I want to put one like here and one over here. Let's put one of these about here. We're going to use our pickaxe to make this a faster job. And we'll put you there. And then I guess we'll do the other one at about the same spot. I don't always like symmetry, but in this case, for what we're doing, it will make sense. Now, as you'll see, if I remove these so we can see this better, 
This gate kind of exists on the far side of these bricks, and it's not particularly well placed. It looks kind of funny sticking out like that. So I think what we'll do here is we might, we might make this sort of into a little bit of a dip here, and maybe use some kind of fences to kind of wall this off a little bit, and then have it rejoin with the rest of this wall on its way around. And that way we can also get sort of a bit of a view of our bees without having to like run inside and look through the window here. So I'm gonna go ahead and sort of play around with this for a little bit and see what I think might work. And I'll kind of bring you all back then when I have something I think we can work with. So here is sort of the design I'm settling on for now because of our limited resources. But I'm pretty happy with how this works out. It gives us a nice window. It also makes it so that drifters and things can't path to us or climb over the wall. Now bears would still be an issue except for what we're going to do last. Well, two things. One is we're going to take down part of this little berm here. And we're just going to sort of shave this back a little bit bring this away from our wall. There we go. Now, most bears can still reach three blocks high, but they can't if there's a block above where they're trying to reach. And that's why we still have a bunch of these left. And actually, that's a lie. The reason we have these is because I made way too many. <laughs> Let's put, I think it's 14. Yep. It'll give us 28 of these. It's not a ton, and it might not ring this whole area. That's okay, I don't think it really has to. I'm just going to put a little bit of a roof just here, hanging over the edge. We'll come back to you. Whoops. And we would have one left over. Wow, okay. Well. We are going to need to make a few more of these shingles in order to finish this up. But I think that's a pretty good start. And in addition to the roof, I'm going to go ahead and do what I did over here. Over here. There and there. And then we can plop these right there and there. And that's not a perfect defense. I think a bear might be able to like get up here and then reach up to our roof a little bit. But that's... I think it's kind of unlikely, because unless we, like, rush in here away from the bear and kind of turn the corner, they're not really going to want to turn. They're going to come against the fence here, and that should stop them. In before a bear slaughters in our own courtyard. And what I want to do with the rest of this area here is I want to have a kind of open-air courtyard, but we'll have, like, a covered area for doing our smithing, a covered area for our pit kilns, because we can't have rain falling into them, and then the charcoal pit or charcoal kiln will kind of be at the back here. And I might, I don't know, I'm kind of tempted to sort of knock out this wall and have it stick out the back a little bit. Maybe even have our little roof thing follow it. That way we would give the walls on the outside a bit of definition. Like this one's okay, having the blacksmith straight across here. I could see a little like bump across the back here for our charcoal pit. And then maybe even bring this part of this wall out just one block just to make it different from the other side, and then also give us a little more space for kilns. But even if we don't, I can still pretty much do two rows of pit kilns exactly across here, and we'll have more than we had originally. Bear in mind that we have a wood pillar over here, so we want to make sure that our pit kilns stop right about here, this block. And additionally, what we could do here is we could sort of make this area back here 
we really like, you know, we've walked here a lot. So we've really tamped the dirt down. We've kind of killed all the grass with our feet. And maybe that is not doing so well back here. So we might not have grass under here, especially if there's a roof. The grass won't want to grow, you know, where the sunlight doesn't reach. So what we could do is put a torch in our offhand so we can see what we're doing. And get our shovel back out. And we could maybe do a wolf, apparently. We could maybe go, like, here. Or even starting here, we could have a different kind of dirt. But one thing we can do with dirt that we haven't done before is, if you take six pieces of dirt and put them in your inventory like this, you can pull out six pieces of packed dirt. Now, packed dirt is quite different from regular dirt in that grass and things won't grow on it. So, that will be a zigzag pattern, I guess. So we can safely fill all this in with packed dirt and then do basically a zigzag pattern. I need that open, actually. We'll do a zigzag pattern like this. And now we have one, two, three, four, five, six pit kilns that we can use along here. And I can also, for now at least, tuck these over top. And when I go to fire the blue clay shingles we need to finish off these roofs, I can do so. And we can even use some packed dirt over here, where the blacksmith is going to be. So we could maybe do essentially the same kind of thing. Get rid of this grass again. Maybe we'll do some packed dirt around here too and along this wall, and we'll see. But I'm going to go ahead and get these shingles going, get the roof in place, and put down some packed dirt, and we'll see how it turns out. folks. Now, while we are waiting for our pit kilns to finish with our shingles, I think we should turn our attention temporarily to our bees. And I say that because we have almost an entire garden or apiary full of honeycomb-filled skeps. Each of these ones that has a little orange door on the front, instead of a black one, which is empty, or a sort of tan one, like this one, which is active and filled but not full of honey. This indicates that there's honey here when it's yellow. So we want to go through and pick out some of these that we're going to harvest while leaving enough to help repopulate the rest of the apiary. Also bearing in mind that I only have this many cattails, so we can't replace a ton of these. We can replace, I'm going to guess, nine. So let's go ahead and we're going to knock open, say, this one. We got, let's see, we had 12, so we got seven cattail reeds and three honeycomb. Each skep will give you three honeycomb, and then, like I said, a sort of randomized number of cattail reeds, and once again, three honeycomb. Now, they're not doing what I was expecting them to do, which you'll find out in a moment if they do it eventually. Not that one. Not that one. There we go. Look at that. A swarm of bees. Now, they're not particularly tickled that we annihilated their... Ooh. Where are you guys going? They're, well, they're gone, apparently. <laughs> yeah, the bees aren't typically tickled that you uh, destroyed their homes, and they will often come out in a swarm. And normally they'll actually hang around and attack you. I do wonder if the rain makes them run away or something and also maybe less likely to swarm. I'm not positive. But yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and we're going to 
harvest a few of these skips, and we will make enough to replace them, like so. And that is how you harvest your bees. Quite simple. But dangerous. Now, let's say that we weren't too interested in being stung by our bees. How would we go about fixing that? Well, we could make what's called a dummy. And that is made with dry grass and, I believe, sticks. Let's find out. I'm pretty sure it takes a couple of these. Here we go, a straw dummy. Two hay bales and one stick makes one dummy. And what these will do is that if they're in the area when you are breaking their skips down, then they will be likely to attack the dummy instead of you. And that's a pretty handy feature. Now, do note these dummies are entities, meaning they can be moved around by other things, so it's usually a good idea to anchor them somehow. I often like to put them down in a bit of a hole, kind of near the bees, so I might sacrifice one of these, like, maybe, I don't know, here? Eh, we'll do... we'll do here. I will sacrifice this spot here. Oh. <laughs> I forgot I did that. As I was saying, I will sacrifice one of these flowers and tuck him in there, and that way as the bees smack him, it won't move around and leave this square, because normally you can kind of push these around a bit. See that? Now I'm going to go ahead and harvest a couple more of these skeps here. We have enough for not quite two more yet, but it's two more. So let's make two more skeps. And we'll harvest, say, this one here. We have an angry swarm of bees once again. And two swarms of bees. Yeah, something is making them glitch out. It might be because they're spawning on top of a fence and they're not sure how to get down. Or it could be that the rain makes them buzz off in a direction. Eh, get it? Buzz off. Whatever you do, make sure you always have at least one skep remaining that has bees in it. No matter how many others you harvest, you don't want to have to go back and start your bees all over again. Alright, and while our shingles keep on firing, I think there is definitely one more casting we can do inside, and that is I want to fill in this anvil mold. Because today, I want to get to some smithing, and I want to show you how that works. So we're going to get enough copper here, and that would be 180 pieces to smelt and then pour into this anvil mold. And there we go, 900 units of copper, i.e. 9 ingots worth, gone in a single pour. So we'll leave that to cool while we get to work on our roof here. And there we have it, folks. We have a finished, but not yet furnished, at least not fully furnished, area for our smithy. Now we're going to need to make a forge, and for that we need cobblestone of any type in a U, like this. We're going to put this guy here, just under the 
edge of the roof because these, like everything that's open and hot, if you leave it open to the sky and it's raining, like today, then it will put your fire out or cool your items. So, the last thing I want to do today was actually engage in some of this forgery. Wait, that's not right. Forging, forging, forging smithing, yes. So what we're going to do is we're going to run one last batch of different molds, I think. We're going to put out our pro pick mold, our regular pickaxe mold. Maybe we'll grab... I don't think I have any... Oh, I have no ingot molds. Well, this is a problem for forging. Silly Corazar. You can't forge anything without ingots. Let's go ahead and we're going to do as many of these as we can. And I guess while these are cooking up, there is something else we could talk about. Something that has to do with our pickaxe in hand. Something rather important we should all know. Okay, with all of those firing up, let's go get our mining helmets on and clear some of our inventory, I suppose. And we're going to go out on a little bit of a mission here to someplace rather close by. Now, when we first started this playthrough, I found a patch of brown coal over here. And I'll show you right where it is. Oh my. We found a single piece of coal right here. Now, I mentioned with copper how the number of nuggets typically indicates how large the surface ore is. But for these, that typically isn't as big of an indicator. Coal veins are typically quite large, and they shouldn't be too far below the surface. I guess we'll find out. And there we go. We have brown coal, aka lignite, in chert. And this is going to be our saver because we've been smithing so far, or rather we've been casting, by firing everything with charcoal. And that's kind of a work-intensive process. And yeah, we could go up there and harvest the trees we have growing here, and they'd give us a little bit of charcoal once we, you know, burned them. But with coal, good old regular environmentally friendly coal, you can do a lot for rather little work comparatively. Now this does not burn as hot as charcoal does, but for basically everything we're doing today, and for a very long while, this will be perfectly fine. The only thing to note is that you can't use this in bloomeries. You can use basically any other kind of coal in bloomeries, just not lignite. As you can see, this is a two block tall deposit, and this could go on for quite a while here. So I think what I'll do is I'll probably skip to the end, and I'll show you everything I was able to mine out. And the reality is, we might actually burn through this pickaxe before we finish it all. Because these coal veins can be enormous. So I'll see all of you in a little bit, when we have, well, at least some of this coal vein mined out. Alright folks, we are not quite done with this seam of coal just yet. However, it is getting on toward nightfall. So I'm just stunning this to keep drifters from popping in and saying hi while we're gone and annoying us when we come back. I forgot you can actually nap chert. Not the kind of thing I always think about. So let's get back home here, get ourselves fed, and then we will address the ingots in the morning. Oh, I almost forgot to show you how much coal we got from that. Check it out. Three stacks and change of brown coal. This will let us smelt and cast and forge for quite a while. And that's because each of these pieces of brown coal burns for 77 seconds, or almost twice as long as the charcoal. So, while the charcoal burns hotter, the lignite burns longer. And if you look at the other kinds of coal, black coal burns for 84 seconds at 1200C, and anthracite, which is the sort of the king of the crop, burns for 196 seconds per piece at 1200C. Pay attention to how long your fuel burns, and note that that burn time only applies when used in a fire pit. If you're using it in a forge out here, 
or if you're using it for other purposes, like putting it in a pile and burning that, then the burn time does not extend to that calculation, unfortunately. Alright, I will see all of you in the morning when it's time for the smithing lesson. And of course, the lesson in how to forge your metals begins with casting some ingots before anything else. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And we'll make a few ingots. But we're going to fast forward through all of this so that we can get to the part that really matters. Okay, folks, here we go. Once your ingots say they are hardened, you don't have to wait any longer. You can take them out right away. Now, as for whether or not you can hold them with your tongs, you can, because they are under 300 degrees Celsius. Now, what we're going to do from here is we're going to come over to the forge, and we're going to just put... Well, we'll do two for now. Why not? Get our tongs back in our offhand. And you can add or remove your ingots from the forge by crouching and right-clicking to add up to four, or right-clicking while not crouching to take them away. You also need fuel in the forge. That would be your coal. However, once you add coal to the forge, it is there until you use it. If you break the forge, you don't get your coal back. Now, like I said, it doesn't matter what kind of coal you use in the forge. It burns for the same length of time. But since the... Brown coal is basically cheaper in terms of work hours. I'm going to do that. Now, it is perfectly possible, and I recommend it, to use basically one piece of coal per forging operation, or rather per forge. So one coal for four ingots, as long as you're fairly efficient on the anvil. If you're just setting out, you might want to heat them up with two, up to the maximum temperature of 1100 degrees. They'll be sort of a yellow hot but I typically work with just one. However, because I'm going to be going slow and I'll be explaining along the way, I will go for two, and then we're gonna go ahead and we'll light this up. And you do need to crouch and right click with your torch and make sure you let go of your mouse before you uncrouch. And this will heat up a lot faster than they did in the Crucible. It takes maybe, what, a minute or so. And once that's ready, we will pick them up. And here we go, they're starting to glow with a faint reddish-orange glow, getting brighter and brighter. Now, you can forge things at temperatures as low as about 700, maybe even 650. I like to work around 900, personally, because you have a good amount of time. We'll take that, and we'll leave that one on there to stay hot, and it'll also get up to 1100 degrees Celsius. Once you have your ingot, with your tongs, of course, you come over to your anvil, Crouch and right click, and you'll get this menu similar to the clay forming menu. And here we have a lot of options. We can make arrowheads now, which we couldn't before. We can make an axe head or a falx head, which we can also cast. And I do recommend if you can cast most things, you should rather than forging them. Now, once you get to higher tier metals, you can no longer cast them, but that's for later. And the other thing you shouldn't cast is the Hellhammer head, but you can't make them out of copper anyway, so move point. You can also make shoot sections for automation, cleavers for slaughtering domesticated animals, hoes, we can make knives, we can make lightning rods and copper chain, nails and strips, and you'll need these for chests and large doors, copper plates, copper scales for armor, pickaxes, pro picks, saw blades, Scythes, shears, shovels, spears, which you couldn't before, and wrenches. I'm going to go ahead and start with a pair of copper shears, because they're a relatively simple recipe. And we're also going to realize that I forgot to get my hammer, and grab that from the wall here. And what we're going to do is, with your hammer in hand, you can now rotate and hammer on your workpiece. Now the default, the default tool mode, which you get with F, you get this menu, is heavy hit, which basically smashes everything in a somewhat randomized pattern around. We don't want to do that because all of our little voxels here are already kind of lined up. 
So we're going to go ahead and we're going to right click to get a better view. Right clicking will spin your workpiece counterclockwise. You can also kind of dance around the anvil. Some people like to do this. I prefer not to. But you're going to use these different modes to push these voxels around and eventually delete them. Some of them at least. So we're going to go with upset right and we're going to hammer to the right. Like that. And we're going to just do a couple of these until we get them slotted into these green boxes here. There we go. Now we have these left to do. Now let's say that I accidentally move something somewhere I don't want. Like I move this one out there. And by the way, on your first hit, for some reason you can move the second voxel out a full two voxels away. Kind of like the opening moves in chess with pawns. I don't know why, but you can. But with this we have a couple options. One, we could try to roll this back up into where it needs to go. Let's say we could move this one back, and we could roll this one back up. However, if you have something down like this and something in the way, you cannot roll your piece down here up. See, it's not going anywhere. So if you're trying to move pieces from a lower row to a higher one, you have to have a one block step to do it. So go ahead and we're going to move these down here. Like this. And you should note that when you click the hammer, I am clicking now. And now. So there's a delay between when you actually click your, your mouse button and when the hammer actually strikes. So beware of that. Especially when we get to the part I'm going to go into now, which is split. Split removes voxels from your workpiece. It's a very permanent thing, and you can technically fix it if you mess up really badly, but you don't want to have to do that. So be very careful when you are splitting your workpiece or boxes off your workpiece that you don't miss. Now, I'm a daredevil, so I like to go relatively quickly with this. And once you are used to it, you'll be able to do that too. So we have our first set of shears. Hooray! However, they're very hot still. So if we take our hammer out of our hands and we swap this out, we can't hold them. Get back here. There we go. So what we can do though is we can come over here and we can quench this now into the water with a satisfying hiss. And once the bubbles stop, that'll indicate it is cool enough to handle. It might still be a couple hundred degrees. We have 26 degrees here and dropping, so that's fine. But now we have a nice new set of shears and an ingot here that is rapidly cooling. <laughs> I'll leave you for now. And with these shears, we can now go and much more quickly and efficiently shear the leaves off of trees for getting sticks and seeds. And as I showed you in the smithing menu, there are plenty of other tools to craft and explore. But that is going to about do it for today's episode of the Vintage Story Guide. I hope you enjoyed this kind of big mishmash adventure in getting our smithing area up and then running, finally. As well as our brand new charcoal pit and our kilns. If you learned something today from this episode, I'd love it if you could give me a little thumbs up and subscribe if you aren't already. Although most of you evidently are. In the next episode, look forward to some more forging and smithing and some more home improvements with storage. We're going to get into some new features in 1.18 that bring back old features. As always, my name has been Corazar. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.